I'm Fred Lowry. I'm a pharmacist and a doctor of natural medicine. I'm here with uh, Dr. Grace Evans, a physician in Asheville. Uh, she is part of um, Asheville's, uh, what, what's the name of your? Living Well WNC. Living yeah. Well WNC, Western North Carolina. Mm -hmm. We're talking about uh, bioidentical hormone replacement and women's health in general. And mm -hmm. uh, first of all, I'd, I'd kind of like to know what got you into the being a physician and uh you know, what what brought you to that uh, profession? Well, I think uh, I was a biology major and in interested in science and uh, trying to figure out what I could do with that. Uh, I discovered uh, the service professions. My, fa my father was a businessman, and I kind of knew what that was all about, so I wanted to explore this other thing. Right. So you uh, you became a physi physician, mm -hmm. uh, obstetrics uh, and gynecology, mm -hmm. and you, you practiced uh, medicine in terms of, you know, especially with hormone replacement conventionally, mm -hmm. and now you've transitioned to being an advocate for what is known as bioidentical hormone replacement. So how did that happen? What, what brought you to that? Well, as a, a med student, I think was when I can first trace back my interests in hormone replacement therapy. I uh, was a fourth-year med student at the University of Washington in Seattle, and uh, they had a great um, uh, public health program there, and Susan Ott was there, who uh, uh, did a lot of research with uh, osteoporosis, and I was able to um, study a lot about hormones and, uh, and how they were originally used. Uh, to prevent osteoporosis and other things, and I just built on that, um, on that uh, educational basis uh, in residency, okay. and as a practicing OBGYN. But you know, we we have a a little bit of a contrast, I think, in what we w would consider the conventional hormone replacement, mm -hmm. uh, which traditionally was primarily uh, drugs like Premarin and Provera. Mm -hmm. And now we're we're seeing uh, more uh, of the bioidentical hormone replacement, which you know, ha has more options, I think, for for women. And uh, so, how how is that in terms of the tradition and the contrast of the two for, for you as a practitioner? Well, uh, what you don't I didn't really know about bioidenticals uh, very much at all when I first started practicing. Um, I prescribed the traditional um, conventionals, uh, Primarin, Provera, Primpro, um, as well as um, uh, North Ender and Acetate, so synthetics, um, uh, which I'm calling conventional um, hormone replacement therapy. Included in that are some uh, generics uh, that w and branded that were bioidentical. Right. And um, it was really after the Women's Health Initiative that I first, uh, uh, when the public started asking for bioidenticals that I discovered it myself. Right. Yeah. So you mentioned the the Women's Health Initiative, which was, uh, I believe that was the largest uh, study with women and hormone replacement. And, uh, mm -hmm. you know, that, that brought a lot of question to hormone replacement. And uh, wh how did you see that study? Initially, um, I remember having to write a, writer, a letter to all of my patients, uh, sort of trying to diffuse the situation. Um, and uh, I did not feel at that time that hormones, all hormones are bad for women. Um, although it looked like uh, with that study that um, Primpro in particular, medroxyprogesterone acetate, which is Provera, uh, was sort of the evildoer of the hormones. Right. So I wrote a letter explaining that, you know, don't, don't, uh, slay all hormones, uh, right. and uh, but uh, probably it's best to come off those hormones. Sure. Yeah. And the headlines were, study stop because it's too dangerous. Yes, yeah. causes heart disease and heart attacks and strokes and cancer. Right. Breast cancer in, in particular. Yeah, and, yeah. And, and so here we have the issue of hormone replacement that has been perhaps the most heavily studied drug therapy ever. And it still seems to be the most confused, and part of that is because of the way it's reported, and it's difficult somewhat maybe to delve into that. But that's one of the things that you've you've done is study that to to understand the differences in those. That, so. That's right. I mean, that's why I've, I so strongly believe in 
uh, and want to get the message out about, uh, in particular, bioidentical hormones um, is because there's so much um, misunderstanding out there, not just amongst patients um, and the general public, but also amongst physicians. Um, I think it is a big sub, uh, subject, and there uh, is a lot of research to um, delve into to really um, tease out the truth. Um, and uh, the Women's Health Initiative was one study, but there continues to be, there's now, that's an old study, and people are still relying upon that study um, as the final word. There have been um, dozens of studies that, that uh, evolved out of the Women's Health Initiative um, right. subsequently. You know, one of the things that I've seen in medicine is, uh, in some ways, the practice of medicine is limited to what is commercially available, and, and so... We give patients drugs that may not fit them as an individual. And in, in w with Premarin, I think there was originally four strengths of Premarin. Right. And with the uh, compounded bioidenticals, you can match those up a little better for the individuals because it's basically limitless what, the, you, know, what you can prescribe in terms of uh, the strength uh, of the medication. So is that something, you know, that you find useful in individualizing? Oh, that's, or? that's huge. I mean, that's, that's the thing that comes to mind when I think about bioidentical hormones is, um, I, I feel comfortable about their safety. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and of course their efficacy. I basically use traditional, um, evidence-based medicine to find the answers about, uh, what is the safest dose, uh, um, what what should we use together? What combinations of hormones do we use? Um, but what bioidenticals allow us to do that's different, sets it apart from conventional therapy, is that you're able to individualize dosing, routes of uh, routes of administration, combinations of hormones, um, and use hormones that you don't. They're not available um, in right. conventional. Um, right. You know, so one of the things that I think <clears throat> brings women to a physician initially is symptoms. You know, so you mm -hmm. start going through menopause, they get their traditional hot flashes, then they go to the doctor. Mm -hmm. So uh, I imagine you see a lot of that. Absolutely. <clears throat> I often say to my patients um, somewhat uh C cynically that uh, I'm, ha I'm glad that people are, are upset and unhappy <laughs> with menopausal symptoms because that brings them to me to get started on something that they don't even realize at that time is really very beneficial for them in the long term as far as prevention of chronic degenerative diseases. It also is the best thing to treat hot flushes, they're, although they're synthetic medicines and other categories that treat those. Hormones are the best thing for that, but it gets them listening to the story and gets them away from the stories that they've heard in the media and from um, other places. Uh, so to me, it's a, it's a necessary evil <laughs> that ends up helping them in the long run. Right. So, and, and in doing that, uh, do you find in working with them that <clears throat> some of their lifestyle choices affect this overall wellness concept? Um, Maybe in terms of diet and supplements and things like that, is that a part of what you do? Oh, absolutely. Um, I, I, what I do now as opposed to what I used to do, I used to do prevention as part of a, a bigger um, palette of uh, activities with patients as far as delivering babies and doing surgery. Now I focus my practice on prevention, which, which largely is lifestyle-based. Um, and I see hormones as, uh, as a big part of this preventative-based um, care. Right. So, and in terms of that, uh, I've, I've heard concepts about uh, starting uh, women on the hormone replacement maybe a little earlier, and, and we've had these, some individuals say, oh, you should only just do it to manage symptoms and then stop, but wh what do you think about that in terms of, you know, when you start hormone replacement and why, other than the symptoms? Right. Well, um, uh, I, well, I, I like to tell, I also want to tell this part of the story, which is that um, women who are against using hormones say, well, using hormones postmenopausally aren't natural. And, um, and I say, well, women used to die when they're in their 60s, and now we're living to av average age of 84. Right. Um, and these <coughs> chronic degenerative diseases start happening, like heart disease, uh, and uh, and dementia and osteoporosis. 
So I'm thinking the long, long term, um, and women come to me in this menopausal um, state, uh, needing care, um, and we they get it, but then they start telling about this longer, longer term uh, story. So the and it ends up that this uh, menopausal transition is a key time to, fortunately, to start hormones for the prevention of these later disease states. It's called the window of opportunity. It's a big research push right now, is looking at that, and uh, but. Uh, women also, when they're older, benefit from um, hormone placement therapy. Right. <clears throat> and we, we actually have a number of older women that, uh, that get, receive hormone replacement from us through our compounding. Uh, you know, but it, it's, it's kind of an interesting thing where you talk about you know, taking hormone replacement is not natural. And, mm-hmm. and, and so, yes, you can certainly make that argument, uh, of course, you know, in, in terms of aging and aging better, mm-hmm. and, you know, there's so many things about hormone replacement that, you know, helps with muscle mass, bone health, cognitive function, mm-hmm. you know, just, you know. And so, you know, I would say some women apparently seem to do fine without it, but, mm-hmm. but some of them seem to do better with it, you know. So well, I mean, I think it's just uh, choices are there. I don't think it's wrong to not use hormones. I think there are a lot of things you can do that with diet and exercise and um, just lifestyle to optimize your health. But to me, uh, using hormones, it's, a, it's, it's widely available. It's not very expensive. Um, it's, it, and it is uh, something that is native to our bodies. I see it as uh, a preventative, and it should be completely safe. And if it also helps you, it is, it is completely safe. If it also helps you, then why not use it? That's sort of my take on it. It's, right. I, I see it as, you know, yes, it can be misused, uh, but so can other vitamins. And as long as you're going to somebody who knows what they're doing, is, uh, is uh, a physician or a pra- another practitioner who's experienced, um, you should be completely safe in using it. Sure. So, you know, uh, one of the things that uh, has come out, and, and I see this in, in men's therapy, is that testosterone causes cancer. Of course, that's not true, you know, right. because if, if that were true, then every young man in the, the world with raging testosterone would, you know, perhaps have, have an op- more opportunity to have cancer. Uh, hormones in and of themselves don't cause that. But, you know, there's a lot of fear about uh, hormone replacement and cancer. And mm-hmm. can you address that? Well, uh, too much of a good thing um, it can be a bad thing, I guess, in, in anything. And as um, I do not think that hormones cause cancer, absolutely, hands down, or else I would not prescribe it. Uh, I used to treat breast cancer um, as a surgeon, um, and uh, and I, I understand a lot of my colleagues uh, are a little bit ca- more cautious um, than I am about whether or not estrogen ca- causes breast cancer, but. Um, uh, or I think that that uh, is a misconception. Um, I, I do not think estrogen causes breast cancer. And the Women's Health Initiative showed uh, the Primarin um, alone arm reduced risk for breast cancer statistically significantly. And it was Provera that switched that, that swung the pendulum to a slight increased risk for breast cancer. Lots of studies have showed reduced risk for breast cancer, and this, about the same degree of studies have shown a slight increased risk for breast cancer, statistically significantly. Um, and so uh, you have to ask your question, the question, um, what, which do I believe? Well, I, I say worst case scenario. What is the worst case scenario? Um, what I tell my patients is about uh, if you use um, hormone placement therapy, um, then uh, worst case scenario is your risk for lifetime risk for breast cancer would increase from 12 out of 1,000 women to 14 out of 1,000 women developing breast cancer over the course of their lives. Mm-hmm. Well, you know, I think w- is, is there's a stark contrast, especially with what is known as the group of progestins, which is a, a drug group. And in that group is progesterone, which is progestation. That's what the body makes to maintain the pregnancy. That's what or is given to women that are having trouble maintaining adequate progesterone levels versus the one that you talked about that was really the problem in the study, medroxyprogesterone or Provera, which is a, the synthetic type. And, and if you give that mm-hmm. to a woman that's pregnant, she will abort. Right. You know, how different could they be? Absolutely. Yeah. Um, progesterone builds bone. Progestin blocks the effects of estrogen on bone. 
uh, progesterone um, matures effective estrogen um, on the breast tissue and on and on. And progesterone does not do that. So. Right. Mm-hmm. So uh, you are available um, to the public if, if they'd like to contact you uh, for an evaluation. Uh, yeah, that's, uh, I'm, I'm sure there are a lot of individuals out there that uh, will maybe take that opportunity. And uh, I'm sure if they, they have questions, they can contact you. Yeah, and uh, check out our our Facebook page. Um, Often I have uh, lunchtime seminars. Fred's been a guest on several occasions and will continue to be, I hope. Um, So if you have questions about this, just give us a call, and um, we'll certainly uh, give you several opportunities to feel fully informed about it. Yeah, and and, uh, another point here is, Grace, you're, you're taking the opportunity during your lunch hour not just to have, you know, to educate, you, you know, your, the people that are coming to see you a little more. And I think that's great, you know. Yeah, I think it's fun. We get a, uh, a bunch of folks together. I need to start inviting more men to the occasions. But people get together and they share their stories. Um, so it's uh, very friendly and, um, and casual. Um, but, and I think it's uh, the best way to um, get a lot of your questions um, answered. Yeah. So uh, we, here we have uh, Dr. Grace Evans, physician uh, that uh, has a practice in Asheville. And uh, thank you for your, your uh, time today. Thank you, Fred. Uh-huh.